Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we're discussing issues that I personally wrestle with with regard to the faith, and today we'll look at the question of whether heaven involves great pleasure. So, so many Christian speakers of today, while they don't explicitly deny the pleasures of heaven, talk very much as though heaven was the opposite of pleasure, that in order to obtain heaven, pleasure must be entirely or mostly denied and abandoned as pleasure, and therefore how could there be pleasures in heaven? Indeed, that view could be supported by certain verses in the Bible, so let's take a look at some of them now. For all that is in the world is the concupiscence of the flesh, and the concupiscence of the eyes, and the pride of life, which is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2.16 Notice that John doesn't say that all of the things in the world are evil. He says that they're concupiscence and pride, meaning that they open one up to temptations to sin in this life, and tempt people to misjudge their own worth. However, those temptations cease to exist in heaven, which he overtly says in verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the concupiscence thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John 2.17 So again, the evil things about the world pass away, but the good things are still present because God is still present to provide them. These verses, therefore, do nothing to challenge the pleasures of heaven. If anything, they outline a positive picture of those pleasures, pure delight without the wicked temptations that often go along with it in this life. And he that taketh not up his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10:38. Jesus refers here to our need to do as he did, to bear the suffering of this life that results from obeying the will of God and doing right. However, the suffering and the burden of the cross are only temporary states. We know this because after his death and resurrection, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, he was no longer carrying his cross. In fact, he'd been given glory and power of an unusual sort. Many verses in the New Testament also refer to this, how the suffering of the cross ends at death for those following Jesus. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall live also together with Christ knowing that Christ, rising again from the dead, dieth now no more. Death shall no more have dominion over him. Romans 6, 8-9 This is just one of many verses that say things of this sort, that the burden of the cross ends at the grave. Therefore, we don't need to continue carrying our crosses in heaven in order to continue receiving happiness there. Take up my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am meek and humble of heart, and you shall find rest to your souls, for my yoke is sweet and my burden light. Matthew eleven twenty nine to 30 This means that the yoke of humility in this life leads to a far greater reward in the next, considering the suffering of some of the early Christians at the hands of the Romans, along with much of the suffering of the faithful since then, including the compelling dark night of the soul by St. John of the Cross, we can judge that verse 30 in particular is only meant comparatively. The yoke of Jesus is light by comparison to the rewards of heaven, which means that the burden of loss and pain in this life can be compared to the rewards of heaven and must therefore be of a comparable type, pleasure versus the opposite of pleasure. So we already have some reason to think that there's great pleasure in heaven. And Jesus said to them, Can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast. Matthew nine fifteen. Jesus explains that when his people are with him, there will be no more burdens or mourning, no more fasting and sacrificing in the way that we understand them, because these are only proper to the state where we're separated from God's full presence. Again, suffering is of this life, but is not intended to be for heaven. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent bear it away. Matthew eleven twelve. This doesn't mean that we must invade heaven with an army in order to be admitted, but rather that we need to permit the violence of the world, the consequence of faithfulness to God, to be done to us in order to receive heavenly glory. Heaven itself contains no suffering. So, in spite of some tough verses and against the overall thrust of modern and recent preaching by certain Catholic speakers, we have every reason to think that the pleasures we sacrifice in this life will be rewarded by far more significant pleasures in heaven, among other things. Next, will there still be law in heaven? 
that's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.